How does Israel's reaction to the Hamas attack on the 7th of October compare to the US reaction to 9-11 when the US, UK, Australia and other democratic nations entered into a 20-year war against the Taliban in Afghanistan with many civilian casualties? Thanks, Margaret. I might start with you, Keith. No, thank you for that question, Margot. I think it's a really important question. Uh, there are many comparisons and there are many lessons. Uh, and I think that the world owes itself the, the opportunity to learn from those lessons. And Australia certainly did. Um, the comparisons are that both involved a massive intelligence failure, both involved the deliberate attack of civilians. And the deliberate attack was designed to traumatise a nation. <clears throat> And like September 11 is a mark in the United States calendar, there's a before and there's an after. In Israel, the 7th of October will have a before and an after. Now, there are many, many lessons to learn. And some of them I think we should consider are that goodwill fades. And I've noticed that for Israel, that goodwill has faded quicker than it did for the United States. And we have to ask ourselves why. And I know that many Israelis are asking themselves why. We also have to make sure that tactical victories don't undermine <clears throat> your strategic objective. And the decisions that Israel will make now will reverberate through this conflict to the point where it will end. And there's two ways you can approach um, what happened. What, one is the lesson from Al-Qaeda. And the United States was quite successful in dealing with Al-Qaeda. The other is an occupation and a counterinsurgency with the Taliban. And that was a huge part of my life. I did three tours there. That ended in a failure. It, it handed the country back to the Taliban. So I, th I think there are lessons to learn there, and there are certainly lessons <clears throat> in the issue of war crimes, and I'm happy to discuss that further. Uh, well, you've just gone to war crimes, so mm. I'm going to ask you, because many people say what they're seeing now, for instance, the refugee camp, are war crimes. Do you see them that way? I, I don't, and, and I know that's a distasteful answer to hear from many people, that, that they don't want to hear that, because when you see civilians killed, it, of course, your heart just aches for the tragedy, the human tragedy well, that's occurring. there are over 9,000 now, and many of them children. And, and look, even if it was just a fraction of that, that, that's still a tragedy. So one of the many lessons from Afghanistan and Iraq is that there's a moral, <clears throat> legal and strategic reason why you should avoid civilian casualties. Israel knows that. This does not assist Israel to have civilians killed, not at all. Now, the laws of war involved a concept called proportionality. It's a distasteful concept to say out loud, but it doesn't mean that the mere fact of civilians being killed is evidence of a war crime. It means that you have to assess and balance the military objective that you're trying to achieve and whether that is proportionate to the civilian casualties, even if they are unintended. But okay. we're talking about a situation where there's one, one or very few targets with potentially many hundreds of casualties. Does that reflect that proportionality in your mind still? Like, where, where does mm. that line end? I, I want to bring in Jennifer, if I can. I'd just like, want to hear a few more voices before we do <laughs> cross-examine sure. you, Keith, which I'm <laughs> looking forward to too. Don't worry, Matilda. Um, uh, but what do you think in relation to that question? Are there lessons and that question around war crimes? I mean, I think the humanitarian impact of what's happening in Gaza right now and what we've seen um, by virtue of the war on terror in Afghanistan, for instance, are horrifying. And in both contexts, we see that the civilian population is suffering in ways that I don't know that um, any of us can really tolerate. And when we talk about proportionality and international humanitarian law and all of the definitions and splitting the hairs over whether or not a target was appropriate, we are talking about 4,000 children who are dead. And if I may be very clear, those are the most unpleasant deaths that these children could have died. They're being crushed in their homes, they're losing their limbs, they're go undergoing surgery without anesthetics. What we are witnessing is horrifying, no matter the definition, and it should shock the conscience of all of us. Um, I, think, uh, I think it's a product of a war in Vietnam, um, uh, you know, the horror of wars. And, and I think, um, you know, we can sit here and agree with, with Jennifer uh, and analyse and have 
um, you know, this critical and, and have this definition. War really is about a massacre of, of people who don't know one another, uh, you know, by people over profit, by people who, who know one another and they don't massacre each other. And that's from a poet, um, um, Paul uh, Valerie. And as somebody who I know um, the impact of wars on, on, on families, on on women and children and the innocent lives, I think it's very hard to sit there and watch what we see on our screens and what we hear and what we read and the devastation and the, the it's just, for me, it just brings back this idea that as a society, Australia, uh, we have to really stand to bring, um, you know, we're such a multicultural society, we have to stand for cohesion. We can't really um, stand by and just watch um, innocent lives um, being uh, lost in, in children in particular. Do you think um, there should be a ceasefire? I absolutely think there should be a ceasefire. Um, I think that it's just, there's no just, you know, for me, yes, we, um, Hamas, what Hamas did, um, it, you know, on, on October the 7th, is just, it should be condemned and has been condemned. But you cannot right a wrong <coughs> with more wrongs. Uh, and I think there has to be a point where we think, well, where, when is this going to stop? There has to be some uh, sanity in this. Uh, it, it's just, you know, uh, we mm. just have to stop it. Well, on that question uh, that our questioner asked in relation to repeating the mistakes, mm. Mark Butler, is that something <coughs> you fear? Well, I mean, <clears throat> when President Biden went to Israel, he made this point to Prime Minister Netanyahu. He said that... Um, I think his advice was that Israel not become consumed with their rage, uh, their understandable rage of what happened on October 7, that they not be consumed by it, and said that the US, in its response to 9-11, had made mistakes, were, were his words. And I think that goes back to what governments across the world have been saying to Israel very forcefully, that, yes, you have a right to defend yourself against attacks like the one you experienced on the 7th of October, but the way in which you do it is critically important. OK, well, uh, on that, Penny Wong said <coughs> that uh, how many civilian deaths in Gaza, essentially, would be considered uh, too many? These ongoing civilian deaths would be considered too many. We're about 10,000 Palestinians dead, pretty much. Is that too many? Well, this is an awful arithmetic to, to get into. This is, a, this is an extremely difficult situation. You don't have two armies marching out to face each other on the plains with no civilians around. You have a situation where Israel is responding to an attack from Hamas and Hamas has deliberately burrowed itself behind civilians and civilian infrastructure. I mean, what, what countries now, including the US, have called upon, including our own government, it is for there to be a pause in hostility. What is in a action. pause, though? What is a pause? Well, a pause, a pause is different to a ceasefire yes. in the sense that a ceasefire usually um, involves <coughs> the cessation of hostilities while a final settlement is being reached, <coughs> while a final settlement is being negotiated that will see the complete cessation of hostilities. Now, Israel and Hamas are not at that point. No. I don't think anyone would suggest they are. So <clears throat> what people are calling for is for actions, the bombing, the intervention to stop so that organisations like Jennifer's and many others besides can get food in, can get water in, fuel, most importantly, medical supplies, doctors from organisations like MSF. That has been the call from our government now for a couple of weeks and over the last few days from the US as well. But can I make the distinction between <coughs> a humanitarian pause and a ceasefire? You know, we, we are doctors in our nature and what you are asking us to do with a humanitarian pause is to bring in the equipment necessary to stitch people up and repair them and then to start the bombing again and for us to then fix them. That is not enough. We need a ceasefire. I mean, what we are seeing right now is dozens and dozens of medical facilities in Gaza which are absolutely raised to the ground. There is no capacity in Gaza at this point to care for the wounded who are there already. There are 3,500 beds in Gaza. Most of them are not available to patients at this point, and there are 10,000 plus wounded. Our surgeons are literally doing surgery on people on the ground, outside, in tents, in open air. There is no capacity at this point for a pause. We have to stop and allow the system to be able to rebuild, to be able to provide care. And I, I just want to say one thing. I was, you know, I'm an American. I was there on 9-11, and I feel so deeply for the rage and the horror 
that the Israeli people must be feeling right now over what has happened to them. But I also know that when I look back at how angry my father and I were sitting there, I wouldn't do it the same. I wouldn't do it the same. So please, let calmer heads prevail right now and allow the people of Palestine to receive the care that they need. Okay. Yeah.